Over the past year of making math content on the internet, I've received many different types of comments, ranging from incorrect to humorous to downright hateful. And today I'll respond to them all, most of them. The first comment reads, The sum of all natural numbers isn't negative 1 on 12, it's just that if you gaze into the infinitely self-consistent spiraling abyss, it shows you time and time again that it does. But just ignore it, okay? Don't assign it a value. I assume that by showing up time and time again, you're referring to its very specific use in the Casimir effect, which uses the extended Riemann zeta function to regularize and assign a finite value to the sum of all natural numbers, but that doesn't mean they're equal. You see, when using the Riemann zeta function, we can sum over the natural reciprocals. This means that by substituting in the value s equals negative 1, we get the sum of all the natural numbers. But this function is only defined for values greater than 1, so Riemann used analytic continuation to find a function which agrees with the zeta function for values greater than 1, but also includes values less than it. By plugging negative 1 into this, we get the result negative 1 on 12. But the problem is, these are not the same functions. We're no longer just summing over the natural numbers and hence it's not a strict equality. So I'll give you credit here and say that in some scenarios we might want to assign it a value, but that definitely doesn't mean they're equal. The sum of all natural numbers is clearly a divergent series. The next comment I have comes from a video I made on the Ross Littlewood paradox and it reads, this guy needs to understand that not all infinities are equal. For every odd number, there's an even number creating equal infinities, but the infinity of whole numbers would in essence include both odd and even, and theoretically being double that just odd or even infinity. I see a lot of people misinterpreting the idea that not all infinities are equal. This statement in itself is true, but the way a lot of people, and in particular this commenter, interpret it is false. In fact, we can prove the integer infinity and even infinity are actually the same size. We consider the cardinality or color colloquially the size of a set based on the number of elements in it. For example, the cardinality of the set containing these objects is 5. We can count 5 elements in there. But what if my set isn't finite and I can't just count the number of elements? Well, we can take another set with known size and pair up each element between the sets. This is another way we can say set A has 5 elements because we know set B has 5 elements. So let's now look at the set of integers and the set of even numbers. It first of all looks like there are twice as many integers as there are even numbers because every even number is in the integers, but there are integers that aren't in the even numbers. But I want you to consider the function f of x equals 2x. What I'm doing is taking every element of the integers and matching it to 2 times its value in the even numbers. Wait a minute, I've paired up every element in the integers to a distinct element in the even numbers, and every even number is mapped to by a distinct element in the integers. So there's exactly one element from either set which pairs to exactly one item in the other set with no elements left behind. What we have here is called a bijection, and since we have this bijection, or pairing up of every single element, these two sets have the same cardinality and hence colloquially the same size. The problem is your intuition tends to break down when it comes to infinity, and if you've just heard the phrase, not all infinities are equal, you'd think it applies to something like this. But in order to actually get a size difference, you'd need to look at something like the real numbers, and in that case there are infinitely many more. The next comment comes from the same video, and it reads, I think he's American. This is a weird trend I've noticed where people outside the US default to mocking the US when they don't understand something. I was born and raised in Australia, hence my Australian accent. I only came to the US when I was 19 to study the beautiful subject of mathematics. But if you're saying I'm from the country with the greatest higher education that people from all around the world move here to get, I'll take it. The next comment I have comes from a video on Thompson's Lamp, which is an infinity paradox related to Grindy series. And the comment reads, It's off. You'll turn the light on and off faster than the speed of light, so electricity won't be able to travel to the lamp. I hate these pseudo-intellectuals paradoxes. First off, I'm not sure if you're calling me or British philosopher James F. Thompson a pseudo-intellectual, but a lot of people have this visceral reaction when it comes to infinity paradoxes because they seem useless. But they're not all that useless. You see, back in 450 BC, Zeno came up with a set of infinity paradoxes. One of them started with a distance of one kilometer and said that in order to cover a distance, you need to cover half of it. This broke the path down into infinitely many sections, meaning there would always be some distance between you and the finish line. Now at the time this was considered an antinomy paradox, of course you can walk one kilometer, but there's a mathematical way to make it impossible. However, thousands of years later, mathematicians discovered that an infinite series could indeed converge, thus resolving the paradox. So a short answer to why these paradoxes exist is curiosity. Oftentimes in math questions like these, we'll leave out physical limitations to leave in the interesting stuff. So I don't think Thompson is a pseudo-intellectual, because questions like these lead to discussion and thinking. The next one comes from a video I have 
have on the potato paradox, which says, gaslighting in its fines, mass will be 98 kilos with potatoes. The chance with the last two doors will be 50-50, not 33-66%. There are two parts to this comment and I'll respond to both of them. The potato paradox starts with 100 kilograms of potatoes that consist of 99% water. I then leave them out to dry so they consist of 98% water. How much do our potatoes now weigh? Well, your brain will initially tell you it's around 98 kilos, but the actual answer is just 50? I initially have one kilogram of dry mass and 99 kilograms of water in a ratio of one to 99. But when I reduce it to 98% water, my dry mass now makes up 2% of the total mass, giving me a ratio of two to 98 or one to 49. But I still have one kilogram of dry mass. This means that for every kilo of dry mass, there's now 49 kilos of water and thus there are 50 kilos in total. So to the top comment on that video, no, from the perspective of math, this is indeed correct. Now as for the second half of the comment, this is a very common misconception with comments like, except this isn't how it works, the other door isn't suddenly more likely to contain the car just because another door didn't. But it is. The game starts with three doors. Behind one is a car and two are goats. You don't know what's behind each door, but the host of the game show does. You're then asked to select a door, let's say this one. The host then opens one of the other two doors, which must have a goat. You're then offered to swap to the remaining door, and you should always take this offer because there's a 66% chance the car is behind the remaining door. Now, even with a mathematical explanation, people don't seem to understand. So I'll jump straight to an extreme example using cards. Say I have a standard deck of 52 cards. I know exactly where the ace of spades is, but you don't. I then ask you to select one of these cards at random and you choose, say, this one. Now at this point, we can all agree there's about a 2% chance you selected the ace of spades and a 98% chance it sits in this pile. I'm then going to remove 50 cards that are not the ace of spades from this pile. Now keep in mind, there was a 98% chance the ace of spades was in this pile. And if it was in this pile, the final card must be the ace of spades. Hence, there is a 98% chance chance this is the ace of spades and still a 2% chance you're holding on to it. So if you swap, you'll win 98% of the time. But if you don't swap, you'll win 2%. But if you're still not convinced, I've written up a simulation of the experiment, which went through 100 runs of the game. So that's why it's not a 50-50 chance when you swap. The new information has completely changed the game. The next question is, sorry, how is this a paradox? These comments appear a lot when I talk about veridical paradoxes, and honestly, I tend to agree with them. In the English language, we come across three types of paradoxes. The most familiar we're with is antinomy paradoxes, which have a logical contradiction or two correct statements which disagree with each other. Now, a falsitical paradox is something that looks like a paradox but is simply false, such as a proof that one equals two. And now my favorite group are veridical paradoxes, which appear contradictory but are proven to be completely true. Things like the potato paradox, string girdling earth paradox, and the coin rotation paradox. So that's why I call everything a paradox. I don't necessarily agree with their naming, it's just that's what they're called. The next comment comes from the coastline paradox, which reads, This is just wrong, man. Maybe infinite decimals, but not infinite length. Then a comment replying why is wrong, then, Nope. First of all, it's perfectly fine to be wrong. We all are sometimes. But please, when someone tries to correct you, at least try to understand them. Now to the original comment. When using the assumptions made in the video, we get that a coastline of any landmass has an infinitely long perimeter, not just an infinitely long decimal expansion. But how? Well, we first assume that a coastline acts as a self-similar fractal, meaning no matter how deep you zoom in, the pattern remains the same. To make it simpler, let's look at the Koch snowflake. We start with an equilateral triangle with side length one meter. Then on each side, we'll raise it to be another equilateral triangle with side length one on three meters. On each side, we've added one on three meters for a total increase of one meter. We will then take each of these sides and do the same, this time with one on nine meters. With our 12 sides, we've increased the overall perimeter by four on three meters. As we continue this process, you'll notice that the length we're adding is increasing over time, making the perimeter diverge to infinity. If we increase the accuracy of a number like pi, we're adding smaller and smaller quantities, which will never make the number exceed 3.2. But with the Koch snowflake, the perimeter is increasing at an increasing rate, leading to an infinitely long perimeter enclosing a finite area. And we can actually see this happening when we look at Britain. As we increase the accuracy of our measure, we can see the length of the coastline getting larger and larger. So while physical limitations stop it from being infinitely long, using the concept of fractals, we actually get to an infinitely long perimeter, not just an infinitely long decimal expansion. Now, the final comment I have comes from a video where I say that 0.9 recurring is exactly equal to one. And the comment reads, 
Wrong, 0.99 is approximately one. The correct answer is 0.9 approximately equals one. They teach this in elementary school in Europe. I mean, technically you're not wrong, 0.99 is only approximately equal to one, but the video was about 0.9 recurring. And those are all the comments I have for this video. If you find another funny one, feel free to share it down below. And if you'd like, please press one of these two little buttons here. It helps me out a lot and have a nice day.